Hello and welcome back. We have another video presented to you from the Weaselhead Glenmore Park Preservation Society that we are now on to winter ecology part three. Uh, we've already previously learned about what makes winter so hard to survive and kind of what makes winter. Um, physical adaptations that animals have to in, survive winter. And now we're going to talk a little bit today about some behavioral adaptations that animals employ in order to survive. Now, um, we do have a number of walks available. There's one that we can give all about um, the sort of accompanying um, facts to go with this webinar. So we hope you'll give us a, a shout, contact us. Uh, we'd love to have you join us on one of our hikes. Now, we'll start a little bit with um, hibernation and torpor. And these are, these are ones that we often hear about. Um, what do bears do in the winter? They hibernate. What do bats do in the winter? They hibernate. Now, what exactly are they doing though? So <laughs> this is a pretty fascinating scale. It's one that sometimes I wish I had um, on those coldest days where I don't want to get out of bed. Um, hibernation is a type of torpor that includes long periods of dormancy over the winter. Um, hibernation, hibernation in the summer is actually called estivation. And the form of hibernation that reptiles do is actually called brumation. And as we learned in the last video, that state of dormancy that we might be tempted to call hibernation um, in insects can often be called diapause. Now, torpor can be as short as a single night and involves reducing metabolic activity, body temperature, and regulating water in the body very, very carefully. There's a bit of a disagreement about whether we can call what bears do over the winter hibernation or not, because their body temperature does not drop as low as other hibernating animals do. So like the golden mantle ground squirrel or the little brown bat, their body temperatures drop very, very close to the ambient temperature around them. Torpor, that includes a long period of dormancy and a body temperature that's significantly reduced, can be called hibernation. Torpor requires some special cells called brown adipose tissue, or BAT, bat, which is fantastic um, when we are talking about bats. Um, these are essentially brown fat cells. Uh, this is to help the a uh, mammal warm back up. These cells rapidly produce heat uh, without the animal needing to shiver because their mitochondria, the energy producer in their cells, is altered um, and they are specialized in burning fat to produce heat instead of producing ATP, uh, which is kind of the body's battery molecule. Um, so because of this decoupling, of the process, the, the metabolic activity that occurs in the um, mitochondria. Now you don't have to make ATP to move the muscles, to shiver, to create friction, to make heat, but you can, instead of directly, you can just directly make that heat. Um, so this is a very, very important mechanism to allow these animals to do this behavior. Now they only use this tissue to warm up and during hibernation, they will use white adipose tissue or other, other fatty tissues, um, except when the animals go through a periodic warming every few weeks where they wake up for about a day or so. Even with this very specialized tissue, it can take hours for a creature to warm up from their hibernating state. And it takes a tremendous amount of energy to do so. So disturbing an animal in hibernation uh, in torpor can significantly affect their chances for survival because they run a very thin budget uh, with their energy um, and water balance. This is the number one reason, uh, or this is one of the reasons why a number of known bat hibernacula or hibernation sites in Alberta are protected and visitation to these sites are prohibited. So it's really, really dangerous for a lot of these animals to actually be woken. Now, not all animals do produce uh, or do have this brown adipose tissue. 
Um, however, some animals that don't hibernate still have fat, still have this brown adipose tissue. Um, humans actually have a really small amount and scientists are unsure why we have this tissue. Um, some speculate we might be able to use it um, with some technological advances for space travel uh, so that we could essentially be in a state of suspended animation. Um, so looking forward to seeing that science evolve. Um, some, some are also looking at how this might be useful um, or looking at how hibernation might be useful so, for some other medical technologies. Um, when warming up their bodies while in hibernation, uh, they do use, um, all these hibernating animals do use white adipose tissue. Um, and they have to continually use it. They don't totally shut off their metabolism because they need to make sure that they are keeping their temperature at a certain state so they don't freeze. And there are some animals that do that and it is pretty phenomenal. Um, but these animals don't want to actually freeze and they will find very, uh, specialized places for them to hibernate uh, because of the conditions that they require. So oftentimes they will go deep into crevices, um, into areas where the temperature will be more regulated than if they were to be outside where the temperature can be anywhere in, in Calgary with our Chinooks, anywhere from plus 10 to minus 35. Um, so they need that steady temperature so they'll find these places um, where the temperature is more regulated, they're further in the ground, um, and where there's a certain level of humidity to reduce their water loss. Now, they will use that every couple of weeks for 12 to 24 hours. It is also hypothesized that this could be used as a mute, an immune system um, regulator um, and to allow them to eradicate waste from their body every couple of weeks. Now, while the amount of waste that these animals produce in hibernation is lowered, because they're not eating as much, they're not uh, doing as much metabolic activity, um, many still have to wait periodically to eradicate their waste. Um, now, bears, however, do not need to defecate or urinate until the spring, unless they are aroused from their hibernation, which can happen when the weather warms up too. Um, they have ways to convert urea, which is the waste protein uh, or waste molecule in uh, urine to proteins in the body. So they can recycle uh, the components of urea back into the body so that their muscles and their bones avoid atrophy. Now scientists are really interested in trying to understand how physiologically bears do this um, to uh, potentially apply the knowledge to prevent atrophy in patients in comas or bone density loss in patients with osteoporosis. Um, so there's some pretty fascinating research going on in this field. Now, one last tidbit on hibernation before we move on. Um, but please let me know if you do want more information, if you want to have a talk all about hibernation. Um, can talk about bats for hours. Um, bats will try to find roosts that have temperatures between two to five degrees Celsius, um, kind of in the, the north, and five to 10 degrees in more southern regions. Um, they'll look for areas, as I said, with lots of humidity. Um, and little brown bats, when they have these more ideal conditions, uh, they can slow their breathing down so low that they're breathing once every two hours. Pretty spectacular stuff. Their bodies do change a lot uh, from when they're active um, to when they're in this hibernating state. All right, now we've got this cute little bankful here so we can talk a little bit about burrowing behavior. Um, this bankful lives in a region called the subnivian zone. So the Nivian region is actually uh, another way we can refer to snow. Um, we've now learned about Kion, uh, which is Greek for snow, and Nivian refers to a snowy habitat. Um, I'm not sure actually if it's Greek in origin or not. I'm going to have to look that up. Uh, wh what is the uh, um, origin of the word? Anyways, that's, that's a side fact um, or a side quest. 
Um, but the subnivian zone is the area beneath the snowpack. It's at the bottom of the snowpack. This area stays at a more steady temperature, kind of around five degrees Celsius. Um, this is for one main reason. Snow has a lot of holes in it for air, uh, which makes it very, very insulative. Uh, so those, those air pockets will prevent the transfer of heat through the snowpack. Because of this, the animals can, that, that live in that subnivian zo zone can stay active despite not having these thick winter coats to help them survive the te cold temperatures or other really significant um, physical winter adaptations. Sometimes you will see these little creatures like voles and mice poking out from underneath from their net snow network um, and these little holes. Um, and when the snow melts, sometimes you will actually be able to see kind of the print, uh, the leftovers of these snowy um, networks. Um, now, however, many of the sn snow holes that you might see are not actually holes for the animals to escape out of. They need quite a bit, uh, uh, quite a few extra holes in order to make sure that carbon dioxide can vent um, to prevent the buildup, which would be a, a very toxic um, uh, breathing environment for these animals. Um, now, there's a lot of decomposing material underneath the snow. And because of that, it's producing a lot of gases. Um, so these snow vents are very important. Now, the snow structure is very critical for these animals to survive, but melt and freeze patterns we'll go back and forth between melt, freeze, melt, freeze, just like we see here in Calgary all the time with the Chinooks. Um, it can make it extra hard for a lot of animals to survive. So we might be relieved when we see that Chinook arch. Um, if you don't get Chinook headaches, you might be relieved to know that some warmer temperature is coming, a reprieve. However, for a lot of these animals, that's actually more dangerous than just staying at that colder temperature. So we're going to jump very quickly into a uh, side quest um, talking about Chinooks because this is an important abiotic or non-living factor in our environment that affects how animals are able to adapt to winter. So I've got a picture here. You can see the uh, Chinook arch nice and strong there. Um, now what exactly is a Chinook? Winds bring moisture from the Pacific Ocean over the mountains where the moisture condenses, so it turns back into liquid and falls as snow or rain. However, as the water changes from this gas to liquid state, it releases heat. And as the air continues towards us, continues east, this warm air will now rush down the eastern mountain slopes and it will gain speed and more heat through friction actually. Um, and this warm wind that rushes down over the eastern slopes is called a Chinook. Now, we've already mentioned because of the important impacts of snow as an insulator that these warm breaks can be dangerous. Um, some animals do benefit from it. Now their food has been revealed, their prey species um, is now not hidden super far underneath the snow. Uh, so it can be beneficial for some of the animals trying to survive the winter. Um, as with all of these things, there's animals on either side of it and they're all trying to balance the benefits and costs of their adaptations. Now, um, with the burrowing behavior, um, not only is their shelter disappearing and they have, uh, their shelter has, that snow has a less insulative um, impact or effect uh, as it's turning to ice, it can actually push them out of their homes as it starts to melt and, free and then freeze um, because that ice can sometimes block off those carbon dioxide vents um, and make their networks uninhabitable for a time. All right, now we're gonna talk a little bit next about some cached food or food stocking. Um, a number of animals all try to store food for the winter, including chickadees, who have an incredible adaptation to help them find all of their cached food. Um, one that um, 
I'm very excited to share with you. Now, in the fall, the part of the chickadee's brain that's responsible for remembering where things are grows by 30% in volume. And this includes growing new neurons, and it will then stay this size over the winter and shrink in the spring. Gray matter is, or, or neurons, um, are some of the most energetically expensive material or tissues in the body. So this seems kind of counterintuitive. We already have to spend more energy in the winter to keep our bodies warm. Uh, we have to spend more energy trying to find food because it's less available. So why would we want to increase um, the presence of a, a tissue that uses a lot of energy? Well, their, ter their territories can cover as much as 10 square miles. And in the fall, they gather tons of uh, seeds and cache them in hundreds of hiding places. And these extra brain cells help them find that food again, and it helps them with that task. So on top of that, during the winter, they have a couple of extra survival to tools. They will eat as much as they can before night and then sleep in groups huddled together in pre-selected winter roosts. And on the coldest nights, they will go into a state of uh, torpor, essentially. They will allow their body to enter hypothermia so that the difference between their temperature and the air temperature is reduced. So there's less um, uh, slower transfer of heat. Um, and they lose less energy trying to stay warm. And then as the temperature, the ambient temperature warms up again the next day, hopefully, um, they will bring their body temperature up with that to help them uh, rewarm their tissues. Um, beavers, they will try to break ice to keep access to fresh food over the winter. Um, however, they also will stalk branches by sticking them in the mud at the bottom of the water. Now, this kind of acts like a refrigerator. Now they can dive down out of their lodges grab their food and bring it back up into their lodge to eat when the water that uh, surrounds their lodge does finally freeze over. So they still have access to that food that they stocked beforehand. Now, red squ squirrels will make huge caches of cones and live in the debris from eating those cones called middens. Um, they are nice and insulated. And on the coldest days, they won't venture out. They won't even move very much to try and preserve energy. Um, seems like a good tactic to me. <laughs> All right, now finally getting to that, that big migratory piece. Uh, there's quite a few animals that do migrate. Um, you can see actually one of them um, quite clearly when you go into the weasel head uh, and you cross the Barry Erskine Bridge. If you look underneath the bridge, you will see the nests of cliff swallows. And in the spring, when those cliff swallows return, um, they will have returned from a very long migratory journey. Cliff swallows migrate all the way down to Chile to their feeding grounds over the winter, and then return back up here in their spring, or our cliff swallows do. They are a homing creature, so these birds will return back to the same homes that they had left beforehand. Now, they'll start their flight back up here in early February and fly along the Eastern Andes up the Gulf Coast to Northern Mexico. Uh, and then this giant group of cliff swallows, because it's not just the cliff swallows from here, it's cliff swallows from all across North America. Um, and when they get to Northern Mexico, they'll split into those two groups. Um, and one of those groups will head more Northwest and one of those groups will head to the East. Um, geese also go through big migrations. Um, however, we do see quite a few of them that stay right here. They don't really migrate. Um, geese can fly as much as, um, 1500 miles in 24 hours, but many geese have stopped migrating as far south. Um, geese historically didn't fly directly south. They usually have stopovers where they stay for a time on their journey to regain some fat um, before they travel on again. And some populations didn't migrate at all, but they did have uh, a more rigid migratory path. Uh, geese have shown themselves to be highly adaptable to changing habitats and 
have changed the routes and wintering areas that they go to to reflect the availability of food, um, changing habitats, and temperatures. There's a number of animals that um, have begun to change their migratory routes uh, because of the availability of food is either waning, uh, reducing at the location they have historically gone to. Um, and so they are adapting, they're uh, being pushed to evolve, uh, to change those behaviors, um, or because of more availability elsewhere. Um, so for example, some of the geese that we see that stay here in the winter, there isn't as much a need for them to travel because of something called the urban heat sink effect. Um, so the urban environment does tend to be warmer than the areas around it um, because of the way that concrete can store heat um, and because of the uh, all, all of our buildings reflecting light into these areas increasing uh, the heat. Now there's also a lot of food available um, in some of these urban environments um, because of human humans being present um, as well as this increased heat. So the geese are adapting and they don't really see the need to fly as far when they can survive here. Um, <laughs> uh, that's a more anthropomorphic anthropomorphizing way to put it, but um, we do see a lot of these geese sticking around. Now there's a number of animals that complete very tremendous migrations to avoid winter, but a lot of research is still being done to understand what triggers migration and how they learn or know where to go. Now we'll come to a little bit more about huddling for warmth. Um, however, we also have a picture here of um, garter snakes that are in brumation, which is a dormant state like hibernation um, that they will, will go into over the winter. Now, garter snakes will go to hibernacula or places to hibernate, uh, sometimes in the hundreds or in the thousands, and sometimes with different species. Um, they often won't eat for months and will live off fat reserves that they built up over the summer and the fall. Um, muskrats will often huddle with beavers. They'll go into their lodges and share the space um, in order to um, share their warmth and, and share some of the warmth from the beavers as well. Um, and flying squirrels, they will also huddle in tree cavities over the winter. So they're trying to share their warmth. Um, now, this isn't going to be purely behavioral adaptations anymore, but I just wanna talk a little bit about some of my favorite adaptations, winter adaptations. So ruffed grouse, they dive bomb into deep fluffy snow to submerge themselves and uh, their body heat will then melt the snow around them, making kind of a sealed uh, shelter with excellent insulation in the snow. And that's what we see on the right there. This is um, snow hole and wing marks from a ruffed grouse uh, that was sheltering in the snow. Um, there are wind, uh, Arctic birds called red poles uh, that migrate down here for the winter. Uh, they can survive up to 20 hours without food and up to 20 hours in temperatures down to minus 54 degrees Celsius. They have a pouch in their throats that they pack full with seeds before they go to roost on a cold winter night and over a 20 hour period they can remain where they are and digest slowly those seeds that they stored in this uh, throat pouch. This allows them to weather through really severe winter storms without having to expose themselves in order to refuel or find food. Um, like the ruffed grouse they actually can dive into the snow uh, to wait out really really heavy storms too. Um, another one of my favorites is the wood frog. Uh, wood frogs can freeze solid for up to eight months. The frogs produce a large amount of glucose, sugar, that goes into their cell and it prevents the cells from freezing. And it binds the water molecules inside that cell um, at the same time to prevent the cells from dehydrating. At the same time, ice will fill their abdominal cavity and encasing their internal organs. Ice even forms between the skin and the muscles. And eventually, 
the wood frog will be totally frozen. It will not breathe and it does not have a heartbeat until it thaws in the spring and it will thaw from the inside out. The heart beginning first and then the tissues as it, you go to its towards its extremities. They are adapted to tolerating blood sugar levels as high as a hundred times higher than normal. Whereas humans, for example, can't handle blood sugar levels two to 10 times higher than our normal level. Um, and because of this, there's actually, again, some more really interesting research uh, towards human medical applications um, in, in better understanding how wood frogs do this really incredible feat. Um, everything from managing diabetes to increasing organ viability during organ transplants by the use of a state of frozen or suspended animation like the frogs do over winter and even treating people who have suffered heart attacks or strokes uh, by better understanding how their blood flow can stop, uh, how the wood frog's blood flow can stop and restart without clotting. Um, it, is, it is pretty fascinating, um, but it's uh, definitely one that requires um, a particular signals from their environment um, in order to give them time to produce this glycerol, uh, which prevents the cells themselves, the cells themselves from getting damaged by the ice crystals in their body. Um, this is the only way that they can avoid that, that large cell death that would occur otherwise. So if they were to be picked up at any one point without all the signals that, hey, winter is coming, prepare, um, and frozen, these wood frogs would die. So the signals that trigger animals to prepare for winter are incredibly important. Um, we learned in our first video about photo period, the length of day, and that's one of those really critical cues for a lot of animals to start producing um, certain molecules that help them survive through the winter or start changing uh, either their behavior or their physiology in order to adapt and survive. Now, another one of my favorites are the water boatmen. They will huddle together and intentionally freeze into the ice. Now, they are an aquatic invertebrate um, that isn't able to breathe underwater. So in the summertime, when they're swimming around, they actually have to make their own sort of scuba tanks. So they've got tons of bristly hairs on their limbs, and these bristly hairs allow them to essentially grab a bubble of air and hold it underneath them, underneath their face, uh, when they dive back into the water so that they can breathe from that bubble before they resurface again. And if you watch them uh, over the summertime, and I'd encourage you to give this a try, you can actually see the surface tension of the water around that air bubble as the water boatman dives back under. Now, the hairs that allow them to hang on to that air um, come in very handy when they go to uh, freeze in the ice intentionally over the winter. So these hairs will allow them to hold air near them as they freeze so that as the ice freezes, it doesn't freeze into them and uh, break any part of them or damage them. Now their dark colored bodies also help uh, because it will allow them to melt the snow, the ice around them a little bit earlier in the spring. Um, and that way they can get back to being active a little bit sooner and take advantage of um, an environment that has fewer competitors early in the season. Now, it is pretty fascinating. So you can see them down in the weasel head and I'd encourage you to go look closely at any dark spots that you might see on the water. Now, always be sure you're not leaving the trails or going off onto frozen water. Um, it can be quite dangerous. Uh, I don't want anyone getting hurt. Um, all right, I think that is everything for today for our behavioral adaptations and a couple of extra ones thrown in, sprinkled in there uh, for fun. Um, so keep an eye out for our next video. We're going to be talking all about animal tracks in the snow. Um, keep an eye out for some of our events. You can visit us on our webpage, um, theweaselhead.com. You can also visit us on our Instagram. 
Um, we will all be posting our events in various locations uh, on Facebook, on YouTube. You can check out all those locations, whichever one you prefer, and you can find that information there if you want to join us for some of our hikes, if you have any questions or want to book one of our school programs or field trips, um, or if we have an upcoming webinar. All right. Thank you very much for watching today. Uh, take care and I'll catch you next time.